Chapter 5 of The Sleeper Awakes This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Sleeper Awakes by H. G. Wells Chapter 5 The Moving Ways he went to the railings of the balcony and stared upward. An exclamation of surprise at his appearance and the movements of a number of people came from the great area below. His first impression was of overwhelming architecture. The place into which he looked was an aisle of titanic buildings curving spaciously in either direction. Overhead, mighty cantilevers sprang together across the huge width of the place and a tracery of translucent material shut out the sky. Gigantic globes of cool white light shamed the pale sunbeams that filtered down through the girders and wires. Here and there, a gossamer suspension bridge dotted with foot passengers flung across the chasm, and the air was webbed with slender cables. A cliff of edifice hung above him. He perceived as he glanced upward, and the opposite facade was grey and dim and broken by great archings, circular perforations, balconies, buttresses, turret projections, myriads of vast windows, and an intricate scheme of architectural relief. Athwart these ran inscriptions horizontally and obliquely in an unfamiliar lettering. Here and there, close to the roof, Cables of a particular stoutness were fastened and drooped in a steep curve to circular openings on the opposite side of the space. And even as Graham noted these, a remote and tiny figure of a man, clad in pale blue, arrested his attention. This little figure was far overhead, across the space beside the higher fastenings of one of these festoons, hanging forward from a little ledge of masonry and handling some well-nigh invisible strings dependent from the line. Then suddenly, with a swoop that sent Graham's heart into his mouth, this man had rushed down the curve and vanished through a round opening on the hither side of the way. Graham had been looking up as he came out upon the balcony, and the things he saw above and opposed to him had at first seized his attention to the exclusion of anything else. Then suddenly he discovered the roadway. It was not a roadway at all, as Graham understood such things, for in the nineteenth century the only roads and streets were beaten tracks of motionless earth, jostling rivulets of vehicles between narrow footways. But this roadway was three hundred feet across, and it moved. It moved all save the middle, the lowest part. For a moment the motion dazzled his mind. Then he understood. Under the balcony this extraordinary roadway ran swiftly to Graham's right, an endless flow rushing along as fast as a nineteenth-century express train, an endless platform of narrow, transverse, overlapping slats with little interspaces that permitted it to follow the curvatures of the street. Upon it were seats, and here and there little kiosks, but they swept by too swiftly for him to see what might be therein. From this nearest and swiftest platform a series of others descended to the center of the space. Each moved to the right, each perceptibly slower than the one above it but the difference in pace was small enough to permit anyone to step from any platform to the one adjacent, and so walk, uninterruptedly, from the swiftest to the motionless middle way. Beyond this middle way was another series of endless platforms rushing with varying pace to Graham's left, and seated in crowds upon the two widest and swiftest platforms, or stepping from one to another down the steps or swarming over the central space, was an innumerable and wonderfully diversified multitude of people. "'You must not stop here!' shouted Howard suddenly at his side. "'You must come away at once!' Graham made no answer. He heard without hearing. The platforms ran with a roar and the people were shouting. He perceived women and girls with flowing hair, beautifully robed, with bands crossing between the breasts. These first came out of the confusion. Then he perceived 
that the dominant note in that kaleidoscope of costume was the pale blue that the tailor's boy had worn. He became aware of cries of, The sleeper! What has happened to the sleeper? And it seemed as though the rushing platforms before him were suddenly spattered with the pale buff of human faces, then still more thickly. He saw pointing fingers. He perceived that the motionless central area of this huge arcade just opposite to the balcony was densely crowded with blue-clad people. Some sort of struggle had sprung into life. People seemed to be pushed up the running platforms on either side and carried away against their will. They would spring off so soon as they were beyond the thick of the confusion and run back towards the conflict. "'It is the sleeper! Verily, it is the sleeper!' shouted voices. "'That is never the sleeper!' shouted the others. More and more faces were turned to him. At the intervals along this central area, Graham noted openings, pits, apparently the heads of staircases going down with people ascending out of them and descending into them. The struggle, it seemed, centered about the one of these nearest to him. People were running down the moving platforms to this, leaping dexterously from platform to platform. The clustering people on the higher platforms seemed to divide their interest between this point and the balcony. A number of sturdy little figures clad in a uniform of bright red and working methodically together were employed, it seemed, in preventing access to this descending staircase. About them a crowd was rapidly accumulating. Their brilliant color contrasted vividly with the whitish blue of their antagonists, for the struggle was indisputable. He saw these things with Howard shouting in his ear and shaking his arm. And then suddenly, Howard was gone, and he stood alone. He perceived that the cries of the sleeper grew in volume and that the people on the nearer platform were standing up. The nearer platform, he perceived, was empty to the right of him, and far across the space the platform running in the opposite direction was coming crowded and passing away bare. With incredible swiftness, a vast crowd had gathered in the central space before his eyes, a dense swaying mass of people, and the shouts grew from a fitful crying to a voluminous, incessant clamor. The sleeper! The sleeper! And yells and cheers, a waving of garments, and cries of stop the ways! They were also crying another name strange to Graham. It sounded like Ostrog. The slower platforms were soon thick with active people running against the movement so as to keep themselves opposite to him. Stop the ways, they cried. Agile figures ran up from the center to the swift road nearest to him, were borne rapidly past him, shouting strange, unintelligible things, and ran back obliquely to the central way. One thing he distinguished. It is indeed the sleeper. It is indeed the sleeper, they testified. For a space, Graham stood motionless. Then he became vividly aware that all this concerned him. He was pleased at this wonderful popularity. He bowed and, seeking a gesture of lower range, waved his arm. He was astonished at the violence of uproar that this provoked. The tumult about the descending stairway rose to furious violence. He became aware of crowded balconies, of men sliding along ropes, of men in trapeze-like seats hurling athwart the space. He heard voices behind him, a number of people descending the steps through the archway. He suddenly perceived that his guardian Howard was back again and gripping his arm painfully and shouting inaudibly in his ear. He turned, and Howard's face was white. Come back, he heard. They will stop the ways. The whole city will be in confusion. He perceived a number of men hurrying along the passage of blue pillars behind Howard. The red-haired man, the man with the flaxen beard, a tall man in vivid vermilion, a crowd of others in red carrying staves, and all these people had anxious, eager faces. Get him away, cried Howard. But why, said Graham, I don't see. You must come away, said the man in red in a resolute voice. His face and eyes were resolute too. 
Graham's glances went from face to face, and he was suddenly aware of that most disagreeable flavor in life, compulsion. Someone gripped his arm. He was being dragged away. It seemed as though the tumult suddenly became two, as if half the shouts that had come in from this wonderful roadway had sprung into the passages of the great building behind him. Marveling and confused, feeling an impotent desire to resist, Graham was half led, half thrust along the passage of blue pillars, and suddenly he found himself alone with Howard in a lift and moving swiftly upward. End of chapter 5 Recording by Sean McGahey, ducttapeguy.net.